Hi, everybody. Um, do you guys like that? It's pretty. Wow. Well, I'm glad to be uh, living in LA and not there. But uh, <laughs> other than that, anyway, my name's Aaron Couch. I'm from The Hollywood Reporter, and I'm very uh, excited to have some of the people that were responsible for Fortitude here with us. So uh, help, help me welcome uh, the, the guys we've got. We've got Simon Donald, who's the creator of the show. We have Sam Miller, who's uh, one of the, the directors. Director that the, we have, uh, actors Veronica Echike, <laughs> Richard Dormer, and uh, Luke Treadaway over here. So, thanks, guys. So I'd like to start with um, Simon. Uh, how did you kind of decide that this was your next project? Um, it was originally a very short idea for a, uh, an independent film. And I told the idea to the executive producer, Patrick Spence, and he really liked it and thought, if we completely reworked it um, and developed it uh, to take place in a community, we would have much, much longer uh, project and the story would run across 12 episodes as it does now um, and the idea of um, setting a police thriller in a place we'd never been to before was just really really exciting and we took it to Sky Atlantic and they um, very quickly decided they wanted to do it so it's um, it, it, it came together really quickly once we pitched it. You didn't feel like you know you sign up for a movie or you think of it as a, a movie and then uh you need 12 hours after that. I mean, how, do, how does that process work? Isn't that intimidating? Well, the original idea would, would never ever have got financed because it was going to be set in Siberia and it was going to be all in Russian. So it was, a, it was kind of just absolutely un, un, unfeasible. <laughs> um, but setting it in somewhere where they spoke English changed everything. You know, and it just made it suddenly a lot more um, likely. Um, but also, originally, it was, it was an idea that didn't... Uh, require us to build up a great a, a community a whole town and once we grew the town uh it just the whole th the whole project grew with it now how true to you know people that live in these communities is this minus the murder and all that you know did you do research that sort of thing to what it's like living there in something like this we did we we there was only one place on the planet that we could find that where the story really worked we there's certain ingredients we needed that you can see from watching it that it, it was important that we had a place where something could come out of the ground that had been hidden there for, for a long time. So we needed permafrost. And there aren't an awful lot of places that have got um, a university, uh, a police force, an industry, and a small community that's really isolated, where they speak English, uh, and permafrost. So we ended up in Svalbard. Polar bears. And, and polar bears. We needed polar bears as well, yeah. <laughs> um, is that the answer? Yeah. 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 So now, um, Sam, once, uh, once you, know, you, you, you present, or get all these ideas, you, you have to make it happen. So how do you approach that, uh, shooting in these conditions and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, mean, I think the thing that, um, you know, the, the kind of intimacy and the truth of Simon's script is the thing that first hits you when you read it. The, the accuracy with which he writes relationships and sort of simple things that happen between people. Um, and then when you take those ideas, having become involved in the characters, you take them and realize, you know, the kind of the framing of that, you know, being in this wilderness. And you realize that that's totally integral to the thriller element of the story. You know, the fact that, you know, it's set in a community that's right on the edge of everything, that's on the edge of where it's possible to live. Um, it becomes a really exciting prospect. You know, it was like, wow, I've, I've not seen that done for a while. And that's, you know, that's going to be very interesting to, to try and make happen. Um, for us, going to Iceland was the kind of furthest north we could get, where we could still be supported. You know, where we could, you could maintain, um, you know, a television film shoot. Um, if we'd have actually gone up to Svalbard, we probably wouldn't have lasted more than a few weeks because mm -hmm. you'd never. You, there's nothing to come in and out of there. So uh, mm. we felt that Iceland was as close as we could get, the furthest north we could get, where we'd get the climate and the weather conditions and glaciers. You know, and all the rest of it, without uh, and still be able to support a film unit. So that was really the, the basis of that. And then we found a village where we could model the community, and so we could m model community and build the sets back in London. So we sort of the shoot was split, sort of half in London, half in Iceland. Um, 
but for us it was also important to have a kind of a seamless um, connection between the interiors and exteriors. So there was some really clever design went on to make you not realize that the sets were in London, really. But, so. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that from watching it, that oh, any of it was shot yeah, there. And yeah. did, um, did you run t into any trouble with the elements, you know, when you were on location? The, bizarrely, we had, a, we, had, we had an issue with lack of snow at one point, which kind of drove us nuts because <laughs> we'd come all this way. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so cold, but no snow. <clears throat> it was kind of their warmest winter, so there were a few weeks where we were, we were actually flying snow <laughs> from London, because that's the best place to get it from. It's like, what? <laughs> There's a play company called um, Snow Business. Who, who, that's what they do. And where are they? They're in London. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, they, they got very wealthy on the back of us. So uh, they're very happy. Um, it was really cold in London, actually. It was colder, colder in London. Colder in Hayes, <laughs> in the oh. studio. Yeah, yeah terrible time there. That, that's yeah. surprising. Worse than in Iceland. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, at times. But, but the, um, yeah, the problems with... What happened with the lack of snow, it sometimes forced us to go higher up and go into higher ground. So some of the scenes we relocated and moved up mountains and moved up into more wilderness because there was more, you know, the elements were much better for us there. Um, and generally, the, the awareness of freezing to death was always present, you know, as we, we managed to, we invested in some amazing clothing. <laughs> well, Richard, you know, I don't know what to think about your guy if he's a, uh, if he's a good guy or a bad guy, if he's a good sheriff or a bad sheriff. How much do you know, did you know about him when you shot the pilot? Did you have to understand his whole story, or did you, were you just given a little bit? Well, um, um, uh, Simon um, filled me in, basically, on the, the broad scope over, the, over all the episodes, you know, the, because I really needed that to know where I was going, to, you know, to be able to pitch it right. Um, so Simon had told me the whole story and what had happened before and what's roughly you know what's going to happen so i did uh, I, I knew quite a lot before before starting yeah but i i'd like to say that a really interesting thing happened when richard started playing dan which was i was still writing um certainly the second half of the show and a bit more than that and i started seeing what he was doing in the rushes and it completely changed the way i wrote the character and um, there was a quality that there was a really unexpected thing going on which is a sort of there's a doubt in the man there's a sort of a, 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 a sense that he, he's afraid he might be weak and that was so much more interesting than what I'd actually given him in the opening couple of episodes that it became something that, were, that we explored um, across the whole se series and it was really interesting to be able to react I've never been in that position before to be able to react to a performance while we were still writing the material and that was great yeah, and it was also interesting whether we were sort of at odds as how, how much to reveal about the series to the cast as we were as we were shooting, because the, 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 the series goes in quite a, an extreme dark place, and it was how much to let people know this was going to happen, or whether to withheld, withheld yeah. them. And we actually ended up withholding quite a lot of information, you know, because <laughs> 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 we like that. <laughs> but it felt rather than anticipate where it was going, because you wouldn't want the audience, to, you wouldn't want to be to see where, you know, you're going to do this, or you're going to do that, to actually hold it back a little bit. So. Veronica, did you have anything, you know, like that where, you, you had information held back, and what, how did you feel about that? How did, did that help your performance? Mm. I don't know. <clears throat> to be honest, um, I think it, it, it was an, a very, very challenging experience. I think the most beautiful experience I've ever had working, because we had, I mean, we didn't know where we were. I didn't know where I was going, where my character was going. But I had Simon and I had Sam, and it's it was so interesting to work as an act, as an actress as you are um, to get. I knew where I was coming from, and I just I just have to follow my instincts. And I'm very um, I'm a maniac of this, and I work a lot and I do a lot of research. And I think it was very very good for me not to have information and just trust and trust uh, Sam, who's got incredible instincts. And he gave me a lot of um, interesting stuff to work on that I didn't, I didn't even think about. I mean, I was trying to defend my character from, from the gods. And I was trying to, I knew that she, wanted, she wants to fix. I mean, she, no, she wants to fit, to fit in this community. And she wants to start from scratch. 
But I am, and I, I started to realize with, um, with, Sam, with Sam and Simon that um, her nature, her real nature, is, um, is taking control over what she wants. She wants to be part of this, but um, she's provoking a lot of situations uh, that she can't really control. And I found that so interesting that I was really working on that conflict all the time. And, and I, I don't know, by the end of the series, I, I got to understand everything, but it, after, you know? <laughs> and I really enjoyed it a lot. And, um, so, and what about you, uh, Luke, with uh, your guy has kind of got the raw deal so far that we've seen, right? He's thrown into a cell. <laughs> so uh, where, you know, what drew you? It gets you... much, much worse. It gets worse. <laughs> I thought it was going to get better. That's OK. So well, he probably has a great journey then, right? Is that what drew you to this? Or? Yeah, I mean, similar. We, you know, I, we had only seen the first couple, so I didn't know where it was going to go. But um, I think, in a way, Vincent, you know, the eyes that you follow landing in the place, and he's the kind of new arrival, and the way in which you sort of leads you through meeting some of the first people and stuff. And so, um, and I think throughout the series, I kind of had that on me as well as like an actor as well. Each episode would come in, and I wouldn't know where it was going to go or. Um, you know, one episode I'll be following a certain theory of what's causing some stuff, and then and I'd invest in that and think that's maybe what it will be, and then I'll get another one, and it's and that hasn't worked out, and so it was I was kind of like Vincent going through it as well. I didn't really know where it was going to go each week, and and that was that was exciting. I enjoyed that as well, and mm. um, and it was different, so it was a kind of new challenge. It was good, and and we should be worried for for your for Vincent. <laughs> Sounds like <laughs> we'll see, <Sure>. we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, Richard, I wanted to ask you this because I'm uh, a big fan of your work in Game of Thrones. And even though they're very different shows, when I watch Game of Thrones or I watch this, it's like I'm in this world, you know? Is there any relation to that for you? Because they're both very striking in that sense, even though this is a real world kind of show. Sorry, do you mean is it? Like, as, as an actor, I mean, uh, how does this compare to something with, you know, this has a big scope, just yeah. like Game of Thrones. Is there any, anything there that, you know, is a correlation for you? Yeah, they're, well, you know, they're they're both um, imagined worlds. But obviously, this is you know, it's based. It it could happen. This could happen. Whereas, you know, Game of Thrones, dragons and and all that there. But it's interesting as well because the the, the designer um, Gemma, she she designed uh, both shows, so they both have that epic quality. Um, but I, I've got to say, and I'm not just saying this because we're here for Fortitude. But I, I Fortitude, it, it, for me as an actor, has just been the best experience I've ever had in my life, to be able to start over all those episodes and to take this character and to just, and I love him, you know, it's, it's rare you come across a character who you just, you just embrace, you just take it in and, and just enjoy the journey so much. So, um, no, it, it's, it, it's been incredible, yeah. Well, Simon, um, could you talk a little bit more about um, just how you are able to you know, right off the bat, we have all these characters and we don't really know what's going on with them, but you sense that there's a lot of backstory there. There's a lot that drives them. How, how did you kind of chart that when you were uh, first conceiving of this? Um, I think, I think what, I, what I really like about the kind of, the, the genre we're in here and the kind of show this is, is the way you can use a crime story to reveal um, things that you never intended to come to the surface and aren't necessarily to do with the crime. They're not necessarily about the, the solution of the crime. And it, the model for that, for me, in a sense, is, is the movie Chinatown, which has, you know, which is a perfect movie, which, which has an overt crime thriller story that, un, uh, uh, that, that reveals absolutely distinct, different, horrifying things about the relationship between people. So this was all about putting together a group of people who would be touched by this strange, um, unprecedented event in their community. And as the cops and the people themselves start to try and work out what's going on, all sorts of unexpected things are brought to the surface uh, and, and revealed. So it was following each of these threads, working out when one comes to the fore. Uh, and it was, it was sort of quite a technical exercise. Also, it evolved a lot. Um, as, as I was writing it, rather than knowing exactly where it was all going, you know, early on, and then just uh, filling the, filling out the script. So it was it was it was complex. 
And, and as you said, you learned as you were shooting too, right? So yeah. it was all, and uh, how, how, how long were you guys all there uh, working on this? Uh, we were, six yeah, six months in total. Three blocks, right? Yeah. Uh, three blocks, each block, uh, three weeks in each place, right? It kind of no. varied, isn't it? Yeah. Three, five weeks? Six months in total, five but, it, but it was like a... Five blocks? Six, five, blocks. five months. We don't know. Six months. No, three, 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 three times, times in Iceland. Three times. Three times, three times, times. Below. Yeah. three times in Iceland, yeah. Three times. Three times in Iceland. No, more to more. No, it was only three times. It definitely was definitely winter, three times. Winter, winter, summer. Oh, right. Whatever you did, it, it turned out well, though. It was, you guys worked hard on it, it sounds like. I'll keep a diary next time so you know exactly. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. What was interesting was going from uh, winter into the, the Icelandic summer because to begin with it was almost completely dark and then by the time June came, I mean I was, I did the, the last two episodes of the series as well by which time it was June and it was like 24 hour daylight. Wow. It was the most extraordinary experience, it was just totally yeah. mind blowing. I remember like sitting outside, sitting outside, thank you, can you hold it? I was sitting outside and it's like sunbathing like 10pm in like shorts and the, my top off and like the first time we'd gone in January or something it was yeah. just bitter cold and no sunlight and it was, it was great. Well, what were some of the, uh, the most challenging parts about uh, working on this project? <laughs> Handling the actors. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had a day when, when, we were, when I was in the script room on my, on my own with, with the script editor when we had our uh, 12 whiteboards for each episode uh, up on the wall, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and we were tired. We'd been writing for months and months, and it suddenly didn't make any sense at all. And there was just uh, there was three hours, I think, where we were we were kind of shaking, and thinking we can't let anybody discover this. We have to somehow uh, hide it and disguise it and fix it and shift it all around. And it was absolutely horrifying. It was really, really. It was like we're going to be found out. We're going to be we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> And we kind of eventually saw there was one problem that was just appearing all over the place. It was one storyline that was messing everything else up. And it was a really, really early storyline that, that we'd hung on to. And it, and it just needed to go in the bin. And when we pulled it out, everything started to join back together again. But it was a nightmare. It was a horrible afternoon. You didn't, none of you knew. No. <laughs> no. So, so, you know, that sounds like, that sounds like a lot of pressure. Um, but how does that, you know, you're making something that, you know, hopefully will fit together and everything will come together and then you'll show it to the world. Um, so you don't, but you know, it's not like a show where you have an audience waiting yet because it's not a second season or something like that. Does that, does that change at all, uh, your approach to this? I think um, I, I was really excited very early on about the idea of, of, of showing this place. It, it feels like a world that we've never seen on a television screen before, and, it, um, and Sam shot it like an epic movie. And I just had an instinct from, from really, really early on that this was going to be a, an incredibly seductive thing to want to, to join. So um, that, that sort of freed us up to be quite um, you know, inventive and anarchic with, with genre and plot all across the, re the rest of the show. So I, I, I was excited from early on, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, something that is uh, striking to me, and I'm curious if this is true, that, uh, you know, at least in fortitude, you can't, you're not supposed to die. You yeah. Know, the, you can't the, bury anything. Is that actually, uh, did you find uh, that we went, true? We went to, it, the, we did research in this place called Svalbard, which is an archipelago uh, halfway between the north of Norway and the North Pole. And it's the northernmost inhabited town uh, on the planet. And that's where this is based. And we went there for the first time um, in the winter when it was completely dark. It was the strangest place I'd ever visited. I thought it was going to be very depressing and gloomy and everybody would be kind of you know, weighed down with this awful oppressive night time. It was completely the opposite. They, had a sort of, it, it, it was, they were excited. They loved the fact that, in the, that it went dark in the winter and all the tourists left and they were on their own. And it was like, <laughs> it, was like it was intimate, it was secretive, it was just strange. It really, that's where the wind chimes sort of idea came oh, from. Yeah. And in this place, Svalbard, there are sort of um, ground rules about, uh, about how you run your life there. You're not allowed to die there, mm. which is the strangest rule imaginable. Okay. You're not allowed to give birth there. 
if you get ill, if you get old and infirm, you have to go to the mainland. And if you get pregnant, then not, not long before you deliver, you have to go to the mainland. So birth and death are outlawed, which is, I've never met anywhere like that before. But why, why? Why you can't give birth? The, because they've, they've created this, this little community that has, uh, it demands that you're, you look after yourself. It demands that you're self-sufficient, that you have a job, that you have uh, able to keep a roof over your head. And because of that kind of lifestyle, they don't want any welfare, they don't want any support. Wow. There's no state support, there's no benefits. So if you're not fit, you have to get off, you have to leave. And that means that the people that are left there are all quite independent, bloody-minded, <laughs> stubborn, um, and... Sex on the loose. Sex, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, I mean, on that point, the wind chimes really, is that... Did they use that for... No, we made that, that You made that the, up. But That's the general true. sense that when it gets yeah. dark, they all misbehave, gotcha. they made up. But, yeah. but the, the wind chimes is, <laughs> is, is ours. Well, great. Well, I'd love to see if the audience has any questions for you guys. And uh, they'll pass around a mic. I'm curious what the casting process was like, because there's so many different nationalities involved. Mm. Yeah. It was a really... Uh, incredibly involved um, and fascinating process to embark on trying to find, trying to create the community and trying to f get the right caliber of people and actors that would fit together. Um, what, was what was really exciting about it was that we were genuinely creating an international community. So we didn't have to, we didn't have those normal kind of qualms about, you know, that Stanley really works really well in that community and, and you know, Norwegians work well, you know, so it was, it was interesting for that. But the um, the process was just was just quite long, quite particular, and quite careful. And I think when we were when the project was coming together, it was actually Michael Gambon who came in first, who agreed first to do it. And that kind of released the you know, basically a lot of other people. We kind of got into place, but they hadn't committed. But as soon as Michael committed, then it kind of set the set the pace for the casting, I suppose. Yeah, we were actually. Yeah, we had a, we had Judy Harkin in London, who was our main casting director, but then we had people looking, meeting in Spain, and people meeting in America. So it was all over the place, and also the fact that you can so much casting can be done, you know, down the line now, which is which opens the process up a lot. So yeah, but it was very satisfying because it was so complicated. But when it came together, it was amazing. This is probably a directorial question, but it also comes to my sense of not liking cold. So I notice in this film and other films, you see the, the um, actors take off their gloves and put the hand on the cold window, take off their hats and um, act like it's just nothing. Is that uh, an actor choice or a directorial choice to have them bare their skin in such cold ass places? <laughs> 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 uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people have different, different. I mean, actually, being there in Iceland, the interiors are actually surprisingly warm all the time. Mm -hmm. So you did go into this sort of, you know, where you stripped off, boots came off, coats came off, gloves came off quite quickly. Otherwise, you start to sweat all the time. So you were in this slightly, either very cold or very hot sort of mm -hmm. world. Um, I kind of try to keep everyone really covered up, you know, because I was aware that when, as soon as necks are exposed, you know, in that, in minus 20, you don't do that. So, um, there were a few... So the sex outside in that big garage with the door open, that was what? Listen, that kind of... That kind of no, let me tell you one thing. Yeah. I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> I um I didn't feel cold. <laughs> I, I, I'm a very I'm a very cold person, but not there, not even there. I mean, I I was I'm Spanish. I hate cold with all my heart. Just I can't stand it. I if I can talk, I just get very angry. And I uh, the days we were hanging around, I I don't know for some reason I was thinking. I love walking with this terrible cold, and I'm enjoying that I feel not, I, I don't really feel cold. I think last year was not a really cold year in Iceland, unfortunately, 
because of the this uh, snow thing. But um, I think also because I was very, I don't know, it depends on your, the moment of your life. I think, uh, how can I explain? Sometimes I, cold really makes me calm down, you know? And um, because I'm a very excitable person, I really didn't, I really didn't suffer, especially that night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I don't think this is really a question, so I apologize in advance, but the beginning of the, fi of the film um, starts off with the polar bears and the glaciers. And the polar bears, I assume, are coming to the town because they're having less ground to live in. Mm -hmm. They're becoming more of a problem for the humans. Mm -hmm. I love that. Can you talk about the, the writing process of, uh, obviously you're writing a, a crime drama, but you're dealing with the environment as well. And I wish this, I don't know how popular or rich you guys are gonna be made off of this. I, I wish you were truly rich and popular so that everyone would get to talking about the environment while they're watching a crime drama. But can you chat on that? The, yeah, it's really, it, it, it really important in the thinking all the way through the story. It kind of goes two ways. I mean, the, I'm really interested in the science of it. I'm really interested in the changes that are happening there. Um, in a real scientific sense, but also writing the story about things that are coming up from the past and things, nature being out of kilter and things being unpredictable and danger lurking just on the edge of the darkness. All that is part of that environment as well. And, and what I, I loved the opportunity to do was to knit these two kind of things together so that the science becomes symbolic alongside the, the character and the psychology and the landscape. Um, but that we, this, we, I take the science very seriously and, uh, and you know, I, re I read as much as I can in order to get prepared to write uh, a story like that. So it, it, it kind of stands up and th th those places, those polar communities are on the edge of a lot of change that's happening in the world. And they're a bit like you know, the canary in the coal mine. The change can be seen there really radically and quickly and it has very profound and immediate effects. And that, the, the, one of the things that you're, you're discussing about the change in polar bear behavior is something I was reading up, up about. And there are two reasons that, that they know this is happening. One is that the sea ice is disappearing and the, the bears use the sea ice as a platform to hunt seals from. So if there's no sea ice, they can't get to the seals, in which case they're stuck on that island with an incredibly low um, uh, food resource. The other thing is that the bears have started to cannibalize one another and that's quite unprecedented. And the, 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 the Vincent is there to investigate this idea that toxins, which are produced by industrial processes all over the world, are starting to show up in apex predators in other parts of the world. And polar bears, like us, are right at the top of the food chain. So that whole um, psychotic behavior that he's talking about is possibly connected to the appearance of these dangerous, deadly chemicals in the, in the environment up in the, up in the North Pole. Hi, um, my name is Christoph Dostal. Congratulations, great, great um, pilot. My question is in terms of producing, how many countries were involved in making this happen? Was it a European co-production, a British production? And was the US somehow involved in the financing? Or if not, how difficult was it um, to bring it to the U.S. for it to be re, uh, uh, broadcast here. Um, we, we, we should have the executive producer here who can really answer that, but unfortunately you've got the dummies instead. Or not. <laughs> it, it's a co-production between um, Sky Atlantic and Pivot. Uh, Pivot are an American, um, uh, they're our American partner. Um, there's no other European co-producer in it. So it's quite, a, it's quite a streamlined setup, isn't it? Yeah. It, made, it, was in, it was very not top heavy in the way that it was produced, in that we had, you know, the, the, our contact to any kind of boss was very immediate and we were very supported through that. So it, was, uh, it wasn't like we were working with, you know, banks and banks of executives who were giving us notes all the time. We were quite sort of uninhibited in the way it was developed. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, we were we were lucky. I mean, it's. Yeah. I mm. think Sky Atlantic very much try to base themselves, see themselves as a kind of HBO style um, approach to program making. So they very much hand the initiative over to the to you know Simon and us on the floor. So. I've never worked on anything with such unqualified support from yeah. from the the company that's making it by a long way. I mean, Sky Atlantic's attitude to this was go further, go darker, go stranger, um, you know, take us as far as, as you want to go. That's really, really unusual. And, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, um, there, was not, there was no compromise coming at us. We didn't have banks of investors, you know, pulling it down a little bit and wanting that compromised a little bit. We didn't have any of that at all, which is amazing. Yeah, I want to ask you about Stanley Tucci. Compliments on getting him in the cast and that scene where the uh, dead body's there and they have the confrontation, they look at each other. You know, that, that was a great scene and, you know, like I said, compliments on getting Stanley Tucci, he's such a great actor and everything, so great job, thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rosemary. I heard that in Iceland they have elves or gnomes or something. Is that true that you have to kind of work around? I read an article about that one time. Is that, did that affect you in any way? It is actually, yeah. They do, they, they, I, I read this, a similar article where they were, wanting to, they were wanting to extend the airport runway outside Reykjavik and the mm -hmm. community were so concerned that that was going to um, um, make the elves homeless <laughs> that they, 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 they had to have you know, all sorts. It went to government before they could get permission to do this. I don't know if the elves are, are there or not. Well, the, 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 one of the, the drivers, um, Alfred Kiesla, he um, he would go, we'd just be driving along through the blizzards and everything, he'd go, over there are elves and gnomes, little creatures. And, and he, he believed this and he wasn't winding me up. And he says, a lot of people in Iceland, they believe in these, these magical things. And he said, you know, some people have seen them but just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're there. You're not there, you know. So that there is that that there really is a, a belief. But that's the whole mythical Norse Viking thing, you know. It's very much. It's all st still very much there. Mm -hmm. And oh. the connection they have with um, animals and the nature in general is amazing. I remember we were trying to see a whale because someone told us, oh, there's a whale in, uh, in a village um, one hour far from where we were. And we, we jumped on a car and we were like four actors trying to find the whale. <laughs> Where's the whale? And, and some and Rainier or another driver, another driver took us to, to see it. And so we were on, uh, coming down to a valley where you could see a long, long piece of um, water how do you say fjords, fjordo, fjordos, fjords, fjord, and and so the driver said, apparently the whale is here, and we were all, we spent like four hours trying to find a whale, <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't see any trace of it, and we were like, no, she's not there, she's not here, and so in the way um, through the whole fjord, we found a farmer, an old man, a lot of wrinkles, uh, you could barely see his eyes and we asked him about the whale and he said ah yes she's it's here it's here and the place wasn't really really big and we were like wait but where she's there and um another farmer told us yeah she's there <laughs> and we were trying to find the whale and the whale was there but it, it, I would guess she was having a nap or <laughs> <laughs> or, she, or chatting with a friend <laughs> deep inside of the place because we spent hours looking at the water and thinking, are they taking the piss out of her? I mean, is, is this a joke? And we believed that the whale was there, but we, ha we are coming from another planet. We just have to be patient. But we wanted the whale to come out and say, hello. Um, <laughs> So we had to imagine that the whale was there. <laughs> They're funny people. They're really funny people. <laughs> but then you've also, you know, you've got the Northern Lights that they look up. I mean, that is going to inspire a country of that size, isn't it? To believe in things for, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And something really magical. And you should all go. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, thanks for uh, sharing your stories. Uh, this was such a, such a fun chat. Thank and um, the show premieres on Pivot January 29th. So uh, January 29th on Pivot. And we'll all be watching, I'm sure. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank thank you. Thanks for coming, guys.